as a, a group, we came together to build out our thesis. Uh, basically, what are the six areas that we would like to focus on, at least for the time being, because these may change as technology changes. And so I'm going to just walk you through some of our thinking behind these six areas. Why, why is this useful? Well, if you're an investor, then maybe you'd like to adopt some of these areas. If you're a startup or an entrepreneur that's looking to get into the augmented reality space, then this might be some great um, uh, information to help you brainstorm uh, and maybe inspire you to do uh, uh, something within the MR uh, environment. And if you're just looking to better understand what's happening in AR, I hope that these six areas will break it down so that you get a sense as to where we are and what the challenges are. So before I get into them, uh, I'm not going to spiel out a bunch of market data. I kind of prepared that, and then I thought, you can just Google all that stuff. I don't need to just pretend like I came up with analyst data, because I'm not an analyst. But you, what you have to know is that um, there's the VR space, and then there's the AR space, okay? And then there's, then there's MR, and then there's XR. But I, let's just keep it simple today by saying VR and AR. So the, there was a lot of activity within the investment ecosystem around VR, um, you know, two years, even as early as three years ago. Uh, and, and that's because um, on the VR side, we started to see actual devices um, be ready for prime time usage. You know, the Oculus moved out of the development uh, kit. Uh, the Vive came out, Samsung Gear VR was launched. And so we actually had working uh, working platforms that could be used both for the consumer and the enterprise, which means the number one important thing that an investor looks at is a the addressable market. And now there was a market. There was the ability for a market to come into play, but it was very risky because these devices were just coming to the market and we kind of all thought that they would be on everyone's head or some of us thought anyways. And it, 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 and it ended up being that there was a lot of activity happening in two main um, areas, one in entertainment and ga gaming and the other in the enterprise with training and simulation. Um, and so for the most part, VR has followed kind of like the gaming console journey and not the mobile journey in the consumer space. And then it has continued in the enterprise to be a very valuable tool, but it's still obviously not in, on everyone's desks, uh, at least not in everybody's, uh, in, in every vertical. Uh, although we're seeing um, the most opportunity within VR within the enterprise when it comes to uh, revenue. On the AR side, though, you know, three years ago, even two years when we started the fund and we said to investors, we're an augmented reality fund, they were like, well, but the time is for virtual reality. Like augmented reality is so far in the future. So good luck, guys. Uh, but augmented reality is a very complex ecosystem. You immediately think about augmented reality as the pair of smart glasses. Um, and that's where um, AR and VR kind of overlap is that, that head-mounted display, that head-worn wearable. But actually, you can do augmented reality with your smartphone, your tablet, with a projector, um, and with a, with a windshield. Uh, there's many flavors of augmented reality, and this is where augmented reality and virtual reality very much differ. Because with virtual reality, you have to wipe the world away. With augmented reality, it's the blurring of the digital and the physical, and you don't need to have a complete you know, uh, field of view for that to happen. You just need a window, or as I like to call the iPhone 10, like a monocle. Uh, and, so, uh, and so I think this is important to note. So, um, um, the investors that understood that there were devices in your hand that could allow for AR to happen um, and also just understood the kind of cross-section between VR and AR as it relates to spatial computing, you know, the 3D element that the AR and VR saw with VR just about two or three years ago. Um, and that's because, again, they start to see that addressable market. Now, Tim Cook said that every iPhone, you know, 7 up or 6 up or whatever it was, can actually support AR kit, which means that now the market is, is available uh, to be tapped into from an AR perspective. So that just gives you kind of an understanding of two things. One, just kind of where investors' heads are at and also what the market it looks like right now with AR and VR, um, but it also helps you understand um, what kind of the differences are between uh, uh, AR and VR, and even within AR, the differences within AR. And, and for the most part, I'm going to be talking about AR with smart glasses or even mobile, uh, but I think the most under-tapped opportunity in augmented reality is projection AR, and we don't talk about it enough. How many of you saw Blade Runner 2049? Yes. What AR was in that? I gave you the answer already. Projection AR, Tom. 
Oh my gosh. Okay, well, it was projection AR, okay? You remember that there was a main character and she came up and if you saw Ryan Gosling's apartment, there was a huge projector on like a dolly and then he was able to use this magic pen, no clue where that was legitimately technology, this magic pen that let her walk around, but we have to suspend disbelief at some point. But that was projection AR, that could totally be the future. That's kind of like the Minority Report AR actually. You know, I, w I went back and watched Minority Report because everybody says that's the AR movie Movie, go back and count how many augmented reality examples are in Minority Report. You can't, you can't. It's like on your hand. It's, that, that movie is actually about gesture control. Uh, we think it was augmented reality. But the augmented reality that we did see was mainly projection-based AR. And so there's a lot of opportunity in augmented reality. And, and before I get into the six areas, that's kind of what I'd love to underscore to you, founders, entrepreneurs, developers, inventors. Um, don't limit yourself to what we think augmented reality is, which is just the smart glasses or looking through a display. There's a lot of opportunity within augmented reality, um, including the fact that augmented reality can be not a display. Hearables, in fact, we consider augmented reality. You know, the, that's the her future, if you've ever seen that movie. Having somebody whisper in your ear and giving you context to the world around you because it can see the world around you, that's augmented reality. Uh, so there's a lot of different opportunities for you to tap into. Okay, Tom get into what you're supposed to talk about. So six areas. Okay, the first area that we look at um, at SuperVentures that is an area of interest is what we call bionic vision. So this is, this is start, or these are startups that are building technologies that will help us get to our eventual smart glass future. And that's not even our eventual future, right? Because we're gonna not wanna wear glasses. Like how many of you are wearing glasses? Let's see, like not even a third, not even a third. Well, put up your hand if you're wearing contact lenses. The hidden glasses, people. We see you now. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, we're going to get to contact lenses because so you don't want to wear glasses and then we're going to replace our eyes. And that was Minority Report, by the way, replacing your eyes. Uh, anyways, Bionic Vision is about trying to get us to that eventual smart glass uh, future. And in order to do that, we, we, we're still not there. We have HoloLens, we have Meta, you know, Magic Leap is coming. We have HUDs, heads up displays like Google Glass, Epson, Moverio. We definitely have devices that are out there, but they still can't do it all. You know, if you ever wanted to see the weakness of HoloLens, for example, just go out into the sun, right? So there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity still, and I'm not, I'm not making fun of it, I'm just saying there's still a lot of work to be done before we can have a device like our glasses where we can just put them on and rely on them because these next, this next pair of glasses is giving us a new sight. Just like our glasses today gave us 2020, we're gonna have you know digital sight and that digital sight's gonna be the standard. And if you don't have digital sight, that's gonna be the disability, not you not being able to see 2020. And so with bionic vision, um, there's a couple of areas of opportunity here. One is in display. And so we're looking at display advancements and the biggest one there probably is in light field, light field technology. So you may have heard about this with Lytro, for example, and Lytro cameras. Another really good company that you should be watching in this space is Avagant, uh, which has a lot of patents and technology about light field technology. So for lack of better um, words, light field technology is trying to uh, provide a more natural virgin's accommodation, which is how your eyes are working with depth perception um, so that it is, allowing you to you know, do camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two um, with your eyes and it does what you, it normally does in the world around you, which it moves things closer and farther away from you so that it looks more real. It also is a technology that um, it allows for the objects, the digital objects to have much higher clarity. They're much more, br they're, they're brighter. You're able to handle the transparency um, even more. And more importantly, it's really easy easy on the eyes so your eyes don't get tired. Okay, so essentially it's, it's moving past looking at a cell phone screen, an OLED screen. And so advancements in display, and this is just one example, is a great opportunity still for startups um, to disrupt the space, come up with much more, a much more natural way for us to be able to handle technology on a 24 seven basis. Another is in just, just in wearing cameras. How many of you bought Snap Spectacles? Whoa, that's why there are so many in that warehouse. <gasps> okay, how many of you have ever worn a camera? Okay, that's great. So about not even, a th not even like maybe 20, 25 people. So 
you know, if, if we really want this augmented reality future to happen, we have to be okay with wearing cameras. We, ha we actually have to be okay with having cameras everywhere because we need our computers to be able to see. That's the big shift. One of the biggest shifts is sensors. Sensors give eyes, ears, you know, tongues to our computers in order for them to understand the world around us. And then therefore automation occurs and augmented reality occurs. And so um, we're, we're also interested in startups that are not only just building advancements in camera, but are also helping to put cameras on the body so that people feel more and more comfortable with wearing cameras. And so we've invested in an Australian company called Foresight. They're building body-worn camera and comm systems, and they're focusing first on helmets. Um, and so they're making smart helmets. They actually, they're not manufacturing the helmet. They have a really great strategy of being the guts that will make any OEM's helmet smart. So they can work with like the Harley Davidsons and the Hondas and the Yamahas of the world. Um, and so we think that this is an extremely critical uh, piece of the puzzle to get us to be wearing smart glasses. Um, the helmet is a really great first start because you do want to be able to see what's happening behind you, for example, or you do want to be able to get your call in your helmet, or maybe you do want to capture that amazing trail and not try to hold up your cell phone at the same time. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why, among many other, we've invested in Foresight. But we do believe that there is a need for us to feel comfortable with wearing cameras. It's exactly why Google just launched Google Clip. Um, and uh, it's why Snap wanted you to wear spectacles. Uh, it's because we need to be comfortable with wearing a camera and inevitably people are not. I wore Google Glass for two years in Toronto. I was one of the 10 in Canada that had Google Glass. And, uh, and you know, people were much more polite than in San Francisco, uh, but people didn't like me wearing a camera. They always thought that it was on, which it wasn't. Uh, but it was really funny, actually, because I had Google Glass and I would also wear this little uh, clip called Narrative Clip out of Sweden. And that camera would take a picture every 30 seconds. It was always on. And I would love walking into a coffee shop and people would be like, oh, Google Glass. And then I'm like, that's off. This is the one taking pictures. This is the one you should be worried about. It's a little narrative clip. They're like, oh, it's so cute. So <laughs> we'll get over it, but we need to have uh, us comfortable wearing cameras. The last part I want to talk about here is the fact that we all have these cords, right? So it, the cord, we have to cut. Uh, we've made, we've seen some significant uh, uh, advancements within connectivity already within the VR space, you know, with Oculus Go coming out. Um, uh, the Vive uh, Focus is supposed to be untethered. Uh, we invested in a Wi-Fi chip out of Austin, Texas called Nitero, which uses a 60 gigahertz Wi-Fi band uh, to untether AR VR devices. They actually got bought by AMD to make that happen. So we're really excited to see that come to fruition. But advancements in connectivity is really important. We need to be able to be mobile, both within VR, but especially AR. And this brings me to my last point, which obviously we're not going to be investing in. But in order for the augmented reality space to really thrive, it's going to need the 5G network. It just is. Like If we still are waiting for our Facebook page and YouTube videos to load, just you cannot handle that in an augmented reality world when you're bringing up digital 3D objects on a regular basis. So the, even if we had that, 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 that device in our hands today, without that 5G connectivity, we're, we're not ready yet. Um, so that kind of points out to some of the gaps and opportunities within bionic vision. The next area we call 3 d find the world. Okay, So Google indexed the 2D world. That was their uh, piece de resistance. That's why we call the internet Google for the most part. Uh, in order for augmented reality to truly sing, the race is on to uh, index the real world. It's the race is on to create the 3D map of this real world, the spatial map, and it's called the AR cloud. If you want to learn more about the AR cloud, uh, both my partners, Matt and Ori, who are extremely intelligent within this space, have wrote great blog posts on it on Medium. Uh, and we're also hosting an event on the AR cloud in San Francisco, which we're going to be live streaming. So it'll be on our Facebook page if you want to check out seven of the startups in San Francisco that are working on these solutions. But why is this important? Well, if we're going to have digital objects live with us at the same as physical objects, they need to be persistent, which means they have to be here. 
They have to be here now and they have to be here when we come back. So imagine like if I'm here and then you go away and then when you come back, I'm just gone. Like that's what would happen right now in augmented reality. So we need to have our objects persistent. They need to be localized, which means that they need to be anchored in space um, so that they look like they're not like floating above or too far down below the floor. They also um, they also need to have occlusion, which means that um, your, your device needs to understand what's around me. So that's called... Um, uh, semantic spatial understanding so that it knows that there's a screen here and that there's a chair here and maybe there was a, a pole here so that when, I, when I'm a digital object in AR, I go behind the pole, I'm actually occluded, which means it looks like I'm hiding behind the pole. And that's currently not possible right now uh, with the, the platforms that are out there for the most part, except for maybe um, occipital structure sensor and their bridge platform. Um, so persistence, localization, occlusion, these are the things um, that make up a, a real experience. These are, the, these are the, the ingredients of the experience that you're, you're having right now, um, this real reality. Um, it actually has all of these features uh, so far. But another thing that is also missing is the ability to have multi-user experience and be collaborative and social. And if you were to probably, uh, outside of looking up information, uh, describe what makes the internet successful it is that collaboration and communication feature, and that's not currently possible without the AR cloud, without this 3D map that can be shared amongst all applications. The last part does speak to that information because if we were able to drop pieces of information around the world, that means that we could actually learn about the chair, the chair's manufacturer, what the chair's made of, who sat in that chair, uh, you know, who, who sat in the chair the most, has the most points on that chair. I don't know, we can have a lot of fun. But that information needs to be shared, it needs to be accessible. And so having, a, having almost like a shared memory of this world is also an opportunity of the AR cloud, which is really, really exciting. Some other opportunities within uh, 3D Find the World just are around computer vision. So uh, again, having the ability to see as a computer is essential for so many things, right? Autonomous vehicles, IoT and automation, um, augmented reality. And so um, uh, platforms that have the ability to recognize things, especially for startups, recognize niche things like just like there's a great company called PickPark and uh, they, all they can do is they, they, they can identify very well nuts and bolts. They, they, they've given the computer the ability to really understand nuts and bolts. Um, or in, in, in the portfolio that I have, we have an optical character recognition company that's really good at translating languages. Or a company called Fringify that can really identify architecture and the lines of architecture. So a lot of folks ask, well, you know, Google's probably doing this. The bigger guys are probably doing this. And in fact, Google has lens, right? Then, and, and so they are working on this, but they're working on it from a broader perspective, like how, and mostly from an object or image recognition perspective. So how can I ad identify that it's a rabbit? But if they don't necessarily have that ability to understand what type of rabbit or a little small part on that rabbit. And so there's still parts of the eye, I, I'd call it, that are still an opportunity for startups to fill in the blanks. The next category is called world building. And so once you have the devices that can support augmented reality, you have the 3D map or the mesh of the world to play with, then the creators need tools to be able to create these digital realities. So developers, designers, marketers, advertisers, entre entre uh, enterprise clients, they need tools. They need tools to be able to build new worlds. And so these tools can be prototyping tools. We've seen a lot of prototyping and design tools that allow for enterprise users to be able to, let's say, sculpt cars um, in virtual reality um, or even mixed reality and then be able to, using HoloLens, have everybody walk around that sculpt and leave notes and collaborate in order to create an action plan for the next, uh, the, the next uh, iteration, like Gravity Sketch is an example from UK. They can be measurement and insight tools like Cognitive 3D that are finally allowing enterprise enterprise clients and developers um, to get insight into how their, uh, their AR and VR solutions are actually doing to make in informative and intelligent decisions on what the next steps are, uh, whether that be in training and simulations or just if there's issues with a game. Or they can also be uh, tools that are facilitating uh, 3D assets, uh, because we're going to need a lot of 3D assets. And we have a lot of 2D assets right now, audio files, video, JPEGs, 
GIFs, GIFs, whatever we determined that was going to be. Uh, but we don't have a lot of 3D uh, assets. And so companies that are facilitating an inventory of 3D assets are also quite lucrative. And there's a really cool company called Quantum Capture out of Toronto uh, that we've also invested in that are uh, creating virtual humans. So they have a virtual human platform. They have really high quality scans of humans that you just literally push a button and they come to life, complete with Alexa or Cortana or IBM Watson support. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity, especially this is a really great area for startup entrepreneurs to fill in. How are you gonna make it easier for everybody to create content in augmented reality, measure content, monetize content? You know, I'm already starting to see a lot of ad networks pop up and some ad ideas within augmented reality. And the great place to look at for this bucket is just the mobile ecosystem. What were some of the early tools that were built in mobile? What were some of the early needs that were there in mobile? Those are gonna be the needs for today. Natural input and output is another area. This speaks to natural user interactions. Uh, so, you know, what is the what is the mouse of tomorrow? What is the right click, left click of tomorrow? Uh, these are the questions that we have. So, this speaks to new controllers, but also speaks to new inputs. Um, like, for example, emotion. We've invested in an emotion tech company called Lightwave because we believe that augmented reality experiences need to be able to understand how you feel if you have a virtual hum human in front of you and he or she is not reacting to you because they can't really read your body language or your face or, or even just get an understanding of how you're feeling, that uncanny valley is going to feel even wider because it's just it's not doing what a human uh, is going to do. So to make that really real, that augmented reality experience real, you need to have new inputs to do so. Or you need new controllers, right? HTC Vive has their controller. Um, uh, we've invested in a VR pen called Massless out of the UK, which is a uh, sub millimeter accurate uh, um, uh, pen that you can draw in MR, AR, or VR. Uh, that's very similar to what you would use in Tilt Brush, but it gives a higher fidelity and it really is a, an incredible device to use for architectures and designers to really make um, VR and AR a usable tool. Telepresence is another category that we look at. Um, this is a very hot category. Again, this is kind of speaking to social collaboration, communication. We believe that, that these types of uh, solutions are going to be the killer apps of tomorrow. Why? Because you know, email, Facebook, uh, social networking, uh, chat was the killer app of the, the waves before it. And so um, the ability to be in VR and be able to uh, be in VR together, so social VR, like what Facebook's done uh, with Facebook Spaces, or High Fidelity or um, uh, Sansar, uh, which is from Second Life, uh, or even um, uh, Altspace, which was just bought by Microsoft. This ability to come together in VR, to be able to meet in VR, talk and chat and share experiences is, is critical. So anybody that's facilitating those tools is key. But also with augmented reality and mixed reality, this ability to have like that new Skype where you know maybe I'm not here uh, and I'm actually in San Francisco, but it feels feels like I'm here, or maybe I'm here and you're all not there, um, and you're at home, um, or maybe we're just at home all together, but we feel like we're in one space. So not necessarily a virtual reality, but still merging the and blending the two worlds together in order to create that new kind of like Cisco video conferencing suite of tomorrow. And finally, the last area that we look at is what we like to call super intelligence. So this is using augmented reality to make you smarter, better, faster at everything you do, whether it's work, life, or play. And a lot of this right now is in work. And so this is a lot about enterprise solutions. So having a pair of HUD, uh, a pair of heads-up display uh, devices that allow for you to have remote assistance or remote coaching. So even though it's my first day on the job, all I have to do is just follow the prompts or have somebody whisper in my ear because they can see what I'm doing through my eyes and I'm automatically a seasoned um, a seasoned amateur uh, on the line um, I probably have skipped three months of training by doing so um, or using using um, a, a, a head-worn device to be able to check my work as I do it so it reduces errors or
or emissions. Uh, these are the types of solutions that are happening today. And we're finding here that we're most interested in investing in full stack solutions that are really um, integrated into this, the existing systems um, within a specific enterprise vertical like surgery or healthcare or field work or oil and mining. And what's really exciting about this here, and a good example that we didn't invest in, but that is a, is a Canadian company that you should keep an eye on is Scope AR out of Calgary. Uh, they have a remote assistance uh, platform using various uh, smart glass devices. Um, but what's really interesting here is that a lot of these startups are moving past the pilot program. And I think I actually saw, I'm going to misquote it probably, so just use Google, but I saw a Deloitte um, uh, Enterprise AR report that said, even on the mid-sized level, 53% of the, of the enter mid-sized enterprises, not even the large ones that are even more aggressive, but the mid-sized enterprises um, have... Uh, already started or are or will be doing a pilot within this year of AR um, and MR um, solutions. And in, you're not hearing a lot about what's happening in the enterprise, but I got to tell you, it's the most active area for AR and VR. It's also the most lucrative area when it comes to investment because the path to revenue is a lot more clear uh, because you're not the mercy of the, the, the fickle you know, consumer market or you're not the mercy of, of developers or designers that are also you know, struggling to, to pay for things. Although there's a lot of opportunity in the developer and designer community as well. Okay, I think I probably went over 15 minutes. I don't know how much time I have. I have 10 more, ooh. Okay, so I, uh, that's, that's it. I have nothing more to say. So, I, but I like to stay up here and I don't know if we have another mic. Do we have another mic or should I run around and, and talk to people with it? this mic? Great, so we have another mic. I thought I'd just kind of open up to questions. So please ask easy ones and let's have a good time. I got two questions. I think he's gonna give you a mic here so the rest of the crowd can hear. Thanks for... Hello? Okay. <laughs> Hello. Great. Hi, I'm Randall. Um, two questions. Uh, I deal a lot with the eye related issues as well. And one of my buddies just, or one of my sons actually just said the other day, well, why don't you just skip the eye and go right to the brain where the signal is ultimately receiving? Because mm -hmm. he's saying, well, really, the eye is kind of the filter. Yeah. So. You know, I could take you right into the spot. I love that. Let's go so, there. And, and yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It does, and there's a lot of companies that are working on that. Yeah, you know, Neurable, um, Elon Musk's company, Zuckerberg's mm -hmm. already announced. We're not anywhere near though that. But you are right. Like I, I, I was at the Cube today here in yeah. Vancouver, and I was using. Air, I use a lot of air quotes when I talk, yep. which is probably annoying to people. But um, I use. Well, you're it, from Toronto. I, I, that's true. I'm from. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I'm from Montreal. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I gotta say uh, that. So, but but I used them. I used it for the word immersive, and it's because yeah. I, don't, I I don't believe that anything that we're gonna do here is going to be immersive when we get to this point where we actually have a brain chip. I think we're gonna look back at this time as like the dial-up time of augmented reality, and so it doesn't. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not uh, uh, in any way belittling what we're working on here. But you're absolutely right. Like what? right right now, what we're doing is we're putting on all this tech on our body, and it's it's a stopgap to is this, these implantables that we're going to be Actually, using. No, we're, we're looking even faster, going no implantable, going right to the part of the brain that receives the signal that I'm sending from my eye. Mm. Well, why can't I just go there and give it the information? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's no reason for a middle chip well, if or you wanna, a filter. If you want to sit down with me, you have a solution, I'd love to yeah. take a look at it. Oh, no. I, <laughs> there's a Halifax company that's doing some phenomenal work mm. there. And looking at analysis plus things like PTSD recognition, because mm -hmm. if you can identify the problem, then you can uh, fix it. Well, secondly, is how far ahead are the intelligence agencies in the defense community? Uh, because I deal a lot with them as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they're often saying, well, the consumer guys are five years behind. Uh, that's what they would say. Yeah. But honestly, what are you seeing? Uh, well, I don't have any secret in, inside information. I, I can tell you that usually technology goes through the same path, right? Mm -hmm. It starts in academia, and then it goes to military, and then it goes to enterprise, and then it goes to consumer. Like, that's basically right. the, the path. And so um, what I'm hearing is that, like, it seems as though the military is interested in more of the BCI and emotion tech, right. which says to me that they probably have a lot of what we're talking about already. You know, it's, yeah. it's old news the for them. The information gathering is And, and in fact, like, there. a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the 
devices that you're seeing or that you may have been hearing about, um, I believe, like Vuzix, for example, uh, mm -hmm. or ODG, uh, for sure, ODG, Osterhub Design Group, came came from military, right? Yeah. Um, and so, um, and it, I don't know if you know, but like the virtual reality, Tom Furness, who's the, the, the grandfather of virtual reality in the 50s and 60s, the reason why he created the first HMD was because he was asked to do so by mm -hmm. the military. Yeah. So yes, you're uh, like, I would assume I'm, I'm not, I have no inside information, but I would assume that like DARPA and all the, the, the agencies, like they're already looking at brain, brain computer interfaces. Yeah. Well, they certainly are. I know in the case of helmets for pilots, uh, the helmets are so heavy that a lot of pilots are having neck injuries. Mm. Um, and so, you know, they're not there yet. Right. But we're very much involved in looking for Canadian companies who, who okay. do great stuff. Yeah, and I know I was in Chicago. I run events in Chicago, and I know that the Department of... Uh, uh, Homeland Security uh, actually has a program too. So um, I know the, gov the government seems also very eager to work with startups in this space, um, in They'll the States and anybody. in Canada. Yeah. So, or uh, around the world. Yeah, yeah. great. Thank, Thank you for you. those questions. Anybody else? Thank you. You gotta, you gotta beat a brain chip. This is gonna be hard. Um, we're working with smart glasses and we're trying to create a hands-free experience. It's a bit of a struggle. I'm just wondering, uh, How's your experience looking at solutions that are hands-free, and do they tend to rely more on gesture or, mm. or voice? Because yeah. both of those SDKs are kind of brutal to work with. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think going back to that slide that I have with natural IO, like we're also eager in finding a startup that's going to help redefine the, the user language, and we haven't seen that yet, right? Um, I think like I think what we're seeing, I think what we're seeing is what you just described. It's just like a use of voice, but voice is clunky and it doesn't work in all environments, especially if it's noisy. A use of gesture, but the gestures sometimes feel awkward, or especially your arms get tired. Um, and that's just on the smart glasses. Let alone what's going to happen with you know just AR Kit and AR Cat. AR core apps um, on like what the new interactions are on those devices as well. I think it's like I think it's anybody's game with that, um, and that that's where you know we've had many discussions. The four of us is kind of my favorite thing is my part my partner meetings with uh, three really really smart guys, uh, and. Uh, we always have these discussions about where we think the space is going to go. And I think we're still pretty confident that there's a lot of room for controllers. I know it doesn't sound so futuristic, but um, controllers are easy to manage. You can put your, your, you can put your hand down. Um, and so I think there's still some room for the use of controllers, the use of your phone as a controller, the use of your, your wearable as a controller. Um, Yes, um, uh, uh, but I, I think like one of the things that um, you should probably uh, keep an eye on is eye tracking. Yeah, yeah. eye tracking technology. Hi. Okay. Oh, you have a question? Oh, you got the pun. Okay, good. Somebody got it. We have time for one more question. Oh, way at the back. I like that. Make them work. Awesome. Um, so you talked about a lot of different areas with AR and advancement there. One area I didn't talk about, which is really exciting to me, is online retail and seeing products in, um, in, in real space and being able to know what you buy before you actually buy it. So I wanted to hear kind of your thoughts on, on that space and what you're seeing there in terms of investment and in terms of yeah. technology. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I think I, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, Super Ventures, we typically invest in core technology or the fundamental layer, not on the application side, although in enterprise and telepresence maybe is more of an, an exception. So I haven't talked a lot about like the opportunities in games or the opportunities in you know retail apps. Uh, there, then there are opportunities there, but uh, I would say just before I answer your question that when it comes to the mobile AR opportunity, with applications, we see that as a mobile opportunity with an AR feature. And that way then it becomes a very tricky investment to make because it's a hit-driven business, right? And it's in, a, in an existing ecosystem that's very difficult to make money. Um, that being said, what's happening in retail? Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you a couple things. I know uh, the malls 
especially the malls and the retailers, they're hungry for it. So I think we're, we're definitely gonna see marketers, advertisers, retail be the ones that are trying to make more Snapchat stuff happening, more World Lens stuff happening, more use of the face mesh. So they're gonna be the ones that are gonna try to drive this, but it, it, if it's not done right, it's just gonna, it may sour things because we've done this before. These are the same folks that try to bring AR in in 2008, 2009. Um, what I'm going to say is please do not just put up a video or a link or an image or web content. Just please don't because we've done that before and that is what's going to cause people to be like, nope, don't need it. So you've got to really think about what tool set we have to offer for retail. So for example, some of the ideas for retail that make a lot of sense, well, number one, indoor navigation is the killer app for augmented reality. Uh, the VPS, which is Apple's working, or Google's working on, um, insider navigation out of Vienna is a great example. So having the ability to be shown how to walk directly up to a product, that's a great augmented reality experience. You know, if you can do it right, to show me exactly where the, where the sale rack is or whatever it might be. Um, another thing that I've heard is a lot of malls talking about how expensive it is to dress up physical spaces. And one of the things you have to think about with augmented reality is everything that was expensive to do, you know, like to, let's say the VR area wanted to make this like rebranded this entire, this entire room as VR area, like black and what's, I don't know, like, like triangles everywhere. Do you know how much money that would be to produce that and then to get rid of it and to ship it? Uh, think of augmented reality as being able to quickly do all that. And so as a retailer, how amazing is it if you have, you know, a uh, sale on Bermuda shorts to make your retail place look like Bermuda. That's an opportunity for augmented reality. Uh, and so right now, are we able to do that completely? No, but even with AR kit, you could have like a Bermuda short rack, for example, and then have like, you know, a beach scene around it to get you kind of excited and in the mood. Uh, that being said, the one kind of uh, caveat that I would, I would say is probably no one's gonna open up an app just to see a beach scene around their shorts. So you gotta kind of think through all that. So I didn't really answer your question, but what I wanted to say is there's a lot of opportunity there, but you have a responsibility to make a good first impression because this is probably what's going to be forced on the user. But you also have to show s such tremendous value that you're going to get that user to actually open up the app because until web AR comes, and that's an opportunity we didn't talk about where you just open the browser and AR is in the browser, it's still going to be very app driven and people you know, they're typically not opening up an app to even, even if you just wanted to show me a video on how that dress was made, you know, people are probably not going to go that extra step. So really think through the, and be realistic with the consumer behavior in order to root whatever your solution is, but it's a good market to go after for sure. Okay. Emery's getting me off the stage. Thank you for having me here at Vancouver. I wasn't kicking you off. I could listen to you talk all night. Oh, sorry. We've Brian, we've lost our slides. We've lost our slides again. That's okay. Um, so up next, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and Tom's going to be up on the stage um, again for the investor panel. Um, but right now, we're going to put um, to the stage a uh, founder panel of uh, four very interesting folks who have gone through the process of getting money. So now i got to go by my phone. Well, we have Wilson Tang from Yumi Bell, who's moderating the panel. We have Tarni from Blueprint Reality. Uh, Tony from Cognitive 3D. And Ryan from Motive.io, who will take the panel now. Thank you, guys. And, um, you know, myself, I've been in um, film and mobile games prior to this with Kabam Vancouver. I was one of the co-founders. And then before that was in um, computer graphics in San Francisco. So we had this argument saying, um, if you were going to start something in AR, VR, MR, why would you do it in Vancouver? And you know, we went back and forth, like funding, of course, and access to talent. Keeping talent is another thing. And it really boiled down to like hype. I think the Americans are really good at hype, and we're not so good. So we're going to run this panel a little bit differently. I'm going to read a bunch of like pretty um, out there statements. And um, I want you guys to be very non-Canadian. If you hear these guys being modest, just say, that's too Canadian, okay? I want you to try that. Because I'm convinced that's the only difference between why we're not as awesome as Silicon Valley. Okay, so we'll start with the first statement. Is that okay, guys? 
Okay. Do it. So don't be modest. I know Tarni can be not modest, I think. I'm pretty sure. But we're bad at it. I mean, Canadians? Uh, yeah, absolutely. yeah, I don't know why. It's, okay. it's not so a gonna, strength. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, statement number one, is that okay? I know exactly what the industry market needs and when it needs it. So we're just going to build the damn thing. Right? Of course we are. So what, we're what, are we, what are we? Why, what, what questions are there left unanswered? You know what? What are you doing, Tony? Well, so with Blueprint Reality, we are building something called Mixcast, which really blends real people with virtual worlds, uh, synthetic objects, and enables them to blend together and connect virtual, augmented, and the real world together. So we're kind of an inter-reality communications company because we think you know many of the things that Tom talked about are absolutely critical. If we can't connect real people, not avatars, not cartoon characters. We can connect real people to each other and to the synthetic world. We don't get there fast enough. So that's what we're focused on is solving that problem. And why do you think Vancouver is perfect for solving that problem? We've got a bunch of great things in Vancouver. You know, I've been building worlds for 30 years in games. And Vancouver's got a great gaming talent pool. You know, huge, yep. huge background. We've got tons of people who are really good at recreating the real world. 3D visual effects people, uh, 3D animation people. We got a lot of film people as well. And so really you put those things together, we've got really all the talent that you need to be able to, you know, kind of create this, you know, harmony between the real world and the synthetic world and, and put those things together in a compelling way. Yeah, the last the last time I looked, um, I did a survey and um, within six square miles, there's all the major film effects companies, all the major animation companies about what, 40 or 50 gaming companies Absolutely. and now about 60 VR AR startups. We're terrible at talking about it though. Why aren't we? Yeah, hey, uh, I think. Oh, I think we need to do a better job. The other thing is, there's two, there's two <laughs> things. One of them, and I, it is that a huge number of those companies yeah. are not headquartered here. So right. we're a service-based city, and so you know, I love the fact that we're seeing way more people founding companies here yeah. and putting IP here rather than elsewhere. And, you know, and I believe that that's you know something that that everybody here should do, and we should invest in, and let's build the ecosystem because we've got all the ability to do that, but we need to have it housed here, not have it be you know, a great place to make things for companies that really own it elsewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Being too Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say it differently, Tarni? Less Canadian? We're the best. Put it here. We need to own <laughs> okay. it. That sounds we will better. own it. Yeah. Yes. So. Okay. Um, Tony. Yeah, so we're, we're seeing some of, just kind of continuing on the talent side for a second, um, we're seeing it, you know, demonstrated through the VR AR Association as well, in that this is one of the largest associations in all of North America, is right here in Vancouver. We track over 130 different companies in this local market that are building different types of startups and different entities in our local market here, um, and we have the largest member base in, in, in the Canadian. world. To Canadian, what do you mean the local market? I'm talking about Vancouver, um, Victoria, <laughs> What about, global? Interior, yeah. what about global? What uh, about global? On the global basis, I don't know. You'd have to ask uh, <laughs> Amory or Dan or somebody like that. Yeah, we're You're working, working on, on it. No, we, yeah. we're, we get our talent locally, but our market is global. There you go. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Brian. Sure. So, um, I, I mean, I can speak to what are we going to build and, and, and how are we going to build it. And, and I would say, you know, from our perspective, we've actually been doing it since 2009. So we absolutely, uh, you know, I believe we, we know what needs to be built in the market. And I think... Um, from my perspective, when you look at the AR market, there, there's, there's one thing I notice when you go down to AWE, you go to these events, you sit in here, we're always talking about stuff that feels two to three years off. Um, you know, we're always reaching for something that's not quite there. Um, but you know, let's take a step back. Every single one of us in our pocket has a phone that's essentially a supercomputer, knows everything about you, uh, has access to all of the collective knowledge of, of the universe, essentially, that we know of anyway. And, uh, and we're still trying to figure out how to make use of that. And, and I, my perspective is where we can already do it. Yeah. And that's what we're focusing on with Motive is, is to um, you know, basically try to empower people to say, look, technology's already here. AR kit is cool and it's gonna do great things, but what can you do with, with what's already in your pocket? And, and I think that you know, one of the things that makes this market fantastic for AR is the fusion of technology and, and uh, storytelling, you know, technology and, and art. Uh, we have an amazing background in technology here. Um, so many people coming from the game industry are feeding into VR and AR. But we're also, um, you know, the second biggest uh, filmmaking, you know, spot yep. on, on the planet. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with Motives. We're trying to fuse those two worlds. One of the things we like to kind of say when it comes to AR right now 
is that it's, it's really a special effect looking for a movie. You know, it's out there, we're doing amazing things, but nobody's really taking advantage of it. You know, think of Jurassic Park for a second and imagine just having the dinosaurs without, you know, somebody like Spielberg to come in and, and turn it into something. And think of what was the most compelling moment in, the, in that whole movie. It's when they're sitting in the car and the, and the water starts to vibrate. There's no special effects there. That's about taking a whole scenario, a whole kind of vision, and, and bringing it down to one moment that really resonates for the user. And so that's what we're trying to do with Motive, and that's why I think you know, Vancouver is absolutely perfectly positioned uh, to take advantage of the AR VR market. And it, it seems like to me, um, for folks who don't know Motive, um, maybe you can describe to people how far ahead of the curve you were sure. relative to Pokemon Go. Sure, yeah. I mean, we, we started building our location-based game in 2009, um, hit the market with Code Runner in 2011, so that, that was a full year before, uh, before Ingress came out. Um, and and we, you know, we were several years into our platform development when, when Pokemon finally hit the market. So uh, that definitely changed the perspective for us. It went from uh, talking about location-based was a great way to end a conversation for a lot of years. <laughs> yeah. uh, and now everybody, you know, everybody wants to know yeah, about yeah. it. So Cool. <laughs> Did you want to add something? Uh, from my side, um, one of the things I was just thinking about of like what's different about Canada and, and the U.S. We need to be kind of prepared to die here. Yeah. Um, you know, like we need to try things and break things and like iterate over and over and over again. And we need to not create zombie businesses that are trying to build something that nobody wants. Yeah. And I think that you know, in, in San Francisco, we see a lot of founders build things over and over and over and over again until they find the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't seen a lot of that here. And I think that that's something that we could do better. That's a really good point. Yeah. Okay. Actually, it kind of leads to the next one is. Um, we kind of touched on it already. Vancouver is the best, worst place in the world to be building a company in this space. Do we believe that? I certainly believe it. I think it's the best place, absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean we talked about the density it's of It's also, we got talent here, but we can get global talent, and people want to be here. Yeah, that's yeah. why our real estate market's so fucked up. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it happens yeah. to be screwed up, but that's because people want to be here. Yep. You know, if it was cheap, it was because they didn't want to be here. So guess what? People want to be here. So, I mean, I know I brought talent in, you know, when we, I was at EA or when I was GM of Relic, yeah. from all over the planet. People are like, oh, I gotta go to Vancouver? Okay, I'm in. You, know, I think whereas that's... you try and get them to a lot of other places, they're like, yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know. Someone <laughs> well, certainly to, now. Someone, I've been Have in... you heard, like in the last six or seven months, the whole everything south of the border has made it easier. That's to made it easier, sure. Of course it has. And there's a kind of whole boomerang <laughs> effect. You and I know tons of folks that went down south and want to come back. They do? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. The Bay Area is a corridor. And I, I think that when you think about Vancouver, everybody talks about the city. Mm -hmm. I think a great case study in, in kind of our, um, you know, our area is, is what Finger Food has done, putting 130 plus people in Coquitlam. And I think that there's an opportunity for us to kind of grow um, where we're building our companies and, and where we're positioning within them, uh, with, uh, position them in the market. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have a lot of challenges in things like housing and making uh, our employees comfortable here. Um, and so does San Francisco. So does San Francisco. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, we also have issues here. And, and I that think that that's... That sounded a little Canadian. Yes. <laughs> There's um, no issues here. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's about centering around Vancouver alone, and I think that there's an opportunity to take advantage of all these other cities that we have yeah. available to us, just like uh, you do with um, Palo Alto, Menlo Park, you know, mm -hmm. all these other cities all on the corridor. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I to totally agree with everything that these guys have said, and I will touch on another point because it kind of speaks to um, a, a big part of how, how we've gotten as far as we have. Um, which is, you know, our government support is actually really fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, our studio got started with a CMF, uh, some CMF funding. Uh, recently, we just uh, landed a contract with Canadian Heritage uh, through, a, through a government program. That's for, definitely too Canadian. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is too Canadian, but in a great way, no, it's right? Good. You know, it's it's, good. Uh, yeah, so you know, for, for close to half a million dollars to build some apps for the capital region, uh, you have Shred, you have IRAP. Um, the, these are, you know, these are things that, that my founder friends down in the valley look look to us. They're kind of with, jealous, with, right? They are jealous. Yeah. You know, and not not to mention that, you know, it's a lot easier to, to provide healthcare. It's a lot easier to yeah. provide a lot of those uh, th those kind of features to your to your employees. So, um, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything these guys have said. Attracting a talent to Vancouver is, is not an issue at all. But we do also have a, a pretty healthy ecosystem of support um, at, at various levels of government that, um, you know, if you're aware of them. Can, can really help you along. Do you think that encourages more or less experimentation? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I think that, and this is, yeah, we, this is like, let's go have a beer kind of question, <laughs> but 
Um, I think it's a little bit of both because I think it encourages experimentation, but strangely enough, there's not a lot of room for failure. So uh, there's a lot of talk about let's experiment, but you also have to show really concrete results, mm -hmm. which is kind of contrary to the point of experimentation at times. Right. Um, but yeah, but I, I do, you know, I do think that some of the safety net and some of the support programs that are out there um, certainly gives you a lot more confidence to, to try something like this and not worry about, you know, what, what might happen if it doesn't work out. It's our, our tax dollars that work. Yeah, absolutely. We should take advantage of it. Well, and That's I right. think we've got yeah. such great support from the government in so many areas, but I think the one area that I'd love to see the government innovate on is, is, you know, something you brought up is the willingness to die. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other piece that I think we talk about with San Francisco all the time is there's tons of startups, mm -hmm. but there's also tons of investors who are willing to yes. invest in them and then expect them to die because the fact is they get lots of exits and they, then they turn the money through yeah. again. Yeah. And so, you know, I know we've got lots of great programs, but what I haven't seen us put in place yet is a program that incentivizes investors to invest in locally owned IP and then get re-incentivized to reinvest it on exit. And so, yeah. so it fuels that channel that basically says, fine, invest it. If it dies, okay, maybe there's even an extra little bit for you if it dies. Yep. But then if you make a win, put it in again, and you'll get an extra bonus, right? And so that way we can kind of kickstart the whole reinvestment because Canadian investors are more tentative. They're more value-based. They've come yeah. from a, let's invest in coal, and let's invest in oil, and let's invest in land, and let's invest in trees, <laughs> yeah. not let's invest in something that's going to be dead three years from now because it will be replaced by something else. But we got to get it. That's the world we live in, right? We got to yeah. change that mentality Absolutely. and flip it forward and have the government, because they already do so much, let's, let's get them in that one more program that can you know, kind of do that to help incentivize no. that I mean, but IP for, growth here. For Vancouver, I mean, we, I mean, certainly people from gaming, we've seen this already. I mean, gaming, digital media has driven the local industry. I mean, yeah. job growth and everything for, what, 15, 20 years? 20 years, the, I mean, I don't know. I've been right? in it since yeah, but when you're, So the so. whole thing about the investors needing to be educated and taking some risks because the market is potentially global. I think that's an education thing that yeah. we need to kind of, you know, um, pull yeah. them along with. Well, we, we found that this market is incredibly tight on full at-risk innovation, mm. right? So when we're talking about full at-risk innovation, uh, building an analytics platform or building the bionic eye, you know, or something along those lines, you actually don't know if it's going to work, um, you know, and you could potentially lose all of your money. And um, when you're talking about VR and AR, it's still very much, when I talk to investors in this market, um, very much a um, emerging technology that you're not sure about. It's not a sure thing. They'd rather, mar you know, invest in a marketing SaaS. Um, yeah. Tried and true, understand, big customer base, good to go. Um, whereas VR, AR, it's the rocket ship, you know, all those SF guys do that stuff. We don't do that here. Yeah, we should just stop talking to those investors. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, we, we didn't, um, when we started the company, we got an early vote of confidence from, from Tom, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that helped us. And it really put us on a path of being hungry outside of our own market. Yeah. I spent all my time on a plane and, you know, going down to SF and raking in the capital and taking advantage of the exchange rate. We didn't apply for programs <laughs> because it was Good just, it, you know, I, I felt like it was, we were going to be writing proposals instead of building product and yeah, failing yeah. and you know building new products. So that's that's what we did, I and think it that worked is a well. Of local money, yeah. right? I mean, the public money. There's a little bit of strings attached, and yeah. whether it's implicit or explicit, um, it does it does tend to steer you in a certain direction. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How much money would you want to do that? Well, it five million. It depends on what. It, you're it depends. Making. So we we raised we I raised think this little. Fail three times before we even come close to breaking even. So you know you've got to do the cycle. It, it depends on what the yeah. it depends yeah. on what the failure is, right? So are we talking about catastrophic failure? Or are we talking about iteration, right? And for 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 us, we raised as little po money as possible and continued to iterate over and over and over again and raised on the new concept each yeah. time moving forward. And if I had a hundred k in the bank, yeah. that was a good day. You know, like that was where we where we wanted to be. Um, you know, and it, it kept us really agile. It kept us hungry to go out and figure out what we're going to do. And now we're getting into raising an actual two million dollar seed. That I'll start closing at five hundred because it's going to keep you know keep us hungry. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Um, actually, the next one is all about money. Uh, there's so much hype around AR and mixed reality that getting money is not a problem. Is that true, guys? I'm about to find out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's um, it's not easy at all. I, I, my investor CRM is about 100 people, 100 firms, um, funds, um, and 
you need to be working in one of the verticals that Tom's talking about mm -hmm. or, you know, in kind of a, a requisite area, or you need to find angels that can do a vote of confidence on you. Um, you know, that will go after the idea. There was a, a, a kind of a gold rush on VR. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people start building applications. There's a misappropriation uh, of kind of um, what the expectations are. And I think that good investors had reasonable expectations. They knew that VR wasn't going to explode overnight and that it was going to be the Nintendo Wii. There was so much fundamental technology that still needed to be built. Yeah. If you had a reasonable expectation of what you needed to do, you were spending less money, you were raising less money, you had a long-term you know, kind of plan. And that's, I think, a, an important element of going out and trying to find capital now. And are you finding that now that you have Tom on your side, is it helping opening other funding sources outside uh, of these borders? We have weaponized Tom very well. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tom, but, you're going to get a lot of um, emails. But, but honestly, like, it, it, it really comes down to your capability to close the investor, right? So Tom can make me a fantastic introduction, but it comes down to the fundamentals of the business, mm -hmm. um, what you're doing, if they think it's going to work. And our typical no, and we get lots of no's, you're going to get 99% no's, um, is going to be around market fit, market size, um, product market fit, you know. It's usually not team, it's usually not like you're in Vancouver, or, you know, anything like that. I haven't had any of those issues. Mm. It's usually just about you're working in the innovation space and we need to make sure that you're going to be the winner. I think a lot of those uh, Silicon Valley VCs do want the leash to be pretty short. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know any of us are trying to raise money and SV, you? Yeah, we've gone a completely yeah. different route, really. Okay. We've done pretty much all private investment. And I mean, I would say that, you know, is raising money easy? No, it's never easy. Because, of course, you're trying to part with, ask someone to part with their hard-earned dollars and bet on you and your team, sure. which is, uh, you, you know, you got to do it. I mean, I'd say it's been a lot easier doing it as a company who's creating new innovations than it was trying to raise money as a mobile gaming company. I've done that, too. That was really hard. But, you know, mm -hmm. it, I, it doesn't mean it's not su possible to be successful. Right, it's, right. You know. <laughs> I, I think another part of that, too, is, is you, you know, you phrased it as, is the hype enough to get, to get the money? And I think that that actually speaks to one of the challenges right now is that AR, VR is seen by a lot of people as hype. And you know, we, we, we haven't started an aggressive kind of uh, you know, conversations with, with investors, but the ones that we've had, they want to see the numbers. Yeah. And, and it's difficult There's in this no market numbers. because there aren't any numbers yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, thankfully yeah. for us, Pokemon has finally changed the, uh, language, you know, changed the conversation a little bit. I mean, it made a billion dollars in less than a year, so there's, there's some numbers. Sure. But, uh, but up until then, I mean, there was just no way to, to kind of, you, you were asking somebody to, to take a flyer, there's no question. So the hype, hype is great. Um, hype makes good headlines, but it but it doesn't doesn't make a very effective investor pitch, as far as right. we found. Well, and you're not going to close anybody on the hype that isn't yours. I mean, at the end of the day, it is going to be about what are you doing and why is it cool yeah. and how is it going to change you have something? Track, you have and, and can you yeah. demonstrate something, yeah. right? And then if you want more money, you got to show that you did something with the first set. Yeah, you know, and that, that's not unreasonable. I think. Nope. That's a good <laughs> Sorry, just to just to jump back to small checks. Um, the the other thing that it allows you to do is move the goalposts a little bit, and I think that that's really helpful as well. Um, so if you're raising a small amount of money that only gets you six months, you can go back in six months and try to raise again. Yeah. Right. And and by that time, the market condition may have changed. When we started raising the last time. Uh, we ended up getting into a Verizon venture tech studio. It was like an accelerator Verizon was doing. And I didn't need to raise any more just because it kind of pushed the goalposts for us. Yeah. Uh, by the time that was over, ARKit and ARCore like, came out of nowhere and launched. Um, you know, and that was a good opportunity for us to start taking advantage of that in our next round. And then we changed our messaging with the support of Tom. Yeah. Tom. <laughs> okay. Rep weaponized Tom. <laughs> um, you can't throw a stone in this town and not hit someone working in AR, MR, VR. So I'm not worried about hiring or scaling. I'm not worried about hiring or scaling. Are you Agree? No, yeah. not really. I've never been worried about hiring or scaling. Yeah. I really haven't. I've never. You're, you're a talent magnet. I don't know why. It's not that. Awesome. I think it's, awesome. it's just that there's awesome. people here, right? If you're doing something that's exciting, yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's that hard to attract people who want to do something exciting. No, like, it's, it's, I, think yeah. the, I think there's two parts to that. Though. You, you gotta be, you gotta be willing to bet on people too. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't know. I think. I, I kind of have my policy around hiring a lot of times. It's like, no bozos, fine. If you can't work with other people, I'm just not bringing you in because this is a team sport. <laughs> and the other one is, I don't know, do a couple interviews and just pick somebody. You know what? They're probably going to be all right and get rid of them if they aren't. But like, get going because you got you to gotta build stuff. If you don't have someone on your team, you're going nowhere. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but like literally <laughs> in the last six months, I've had friends, super talented folks that's worked at Microsoft, Apple's of the world, dying to come back. Yeah, and I think that's a this boomerang effect. It's um, it's it's accelerating, 
So I think, you know, I'm certainly not worried about finding no. world-class talent to come back to Vancouver. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm one of them. I was at Microsoft for a while, and, mm -hmm. and I'm back now. I mean, there's, you know, there, there really is no better place in the world to live. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, not, not only is the talent here, I mean, we have, we have three universities locally just turning out un unbelievably talented uh, unbelievably talented workers but the other the other thing I mean Tony touched on it this is an exciting space you know it, it's uh, when you're a developer when you're a young developer the thing that's you know you want to do something that's relevant and, and feels like it can make a difference and uh, you know that's that's our biggest calling card right now is that it's it's fun and it, it's exciting and you don't know when any day is going to look like but um, but man it's a lot easier to get people excited about work like that so um, yeah I, I, I think that uh, you know tons of tons of people tons of opportunities and yeah scaling up has never been something it I've also been seems like to me I, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong but it seems like um like I certainly felt like the foundation stones are there already. Mm -hmm. the, the, the tech that you guys are building are all the foundation stones. So all the opportunities coming up um, you know, here and in the near future is building exciting content and experiences yeah. for various verticals. Yeah, and we're I ready. I mean, that, that, yeah, that's, yeah. that's exactly what, you know, kind of our, our, our fundamental premise is that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of amazing technology five years out, but there's unbelievably incredible technology in everybody's pocket today. So let's take advantage and uh, yeah. 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 It, it also goes back to those government programs as well. Like it's really difficult to try to fund content anywhere in Silicon Valley. Like it's, it's almost impossible mm -hmm. unless it's like an enterprise play or uh, some sort of marketplace or just it has some sort of scaling function to it. Um, but when you're talking about content, we have all these wonderful programs here and a lot of them are around content creation and you can take advantage of them, um, you know, pretty heavily in this. this yeah, area. And I think, um, you know, like I, I'm sure folks know about the mixed reality corridor initiative for Microsoft. I think they've done a really good job kind of accelerating these partnerships with really diverse group of um, businesses that AR, you know, I, got, I like to say that um, if you say you're a VR and AR company, it's like saying I'm a movie company. <laughs> what kind of movies do you want to tell? What kind of stories do you want to tell? What kind of movies do you want to make? And I think um, people like Microsoft and also um, the, the kind of the AR, VR group um, have done really well kind of introducing um, the, the technology folks with different enterprises so that this partnership is really seeding a lot of really interesting um, you know, content experiences. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think about that? Uh, what's your experience? In well, I, I, yeah, yeah. Com I completely agree. And, and you know, I, I think that, it, I, I think that, you know, if you look at, take, take VR, for example, and I know we're more on the AR side right now, but if you look at VR, I mean, VR is, is in the wrong part of the hype curve right now. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, it's, it's because the content's not there. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's creating that engaging experience. I mean, you can throw all the technology you want at something, but if you don't have uh, something that connects with people emotionally, you're, you're, you're really not creating something that, that has, that's going to have a long lasting impact. Um, you know, I mean, take, take a look at Pokemon. It's put out there as kind of the, you know, the, the most successful AR game. I think everybody, you know, will kind of give a sly nod and say, yeah, it has nothing to do with AR. And that's, there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but why did it work? It didn't where everybody turned the camera off because it was burning the battery. You know, everybody, nobody really took advantage of it as an AR game, but it worked because it appealed to, to people on an emotional level. Yeah. And to me, that's, that's the big piece that's missing, but, but that's what people are, that's what people want right now. You know, that's, so that's, you know, that, again, that's our focus is saying, look, like how can we take this technology and put it into some sort of format that, you know, starts to really get to people at an emotional, engaging level so that uh, it has that staying power. Yeah, I think we, I mean, we met last week uh, yeah. for the first time and uh, we had a little discussion about the, these kind of buzzwords, VR and AR and mixed reality and uh, XR. For us, there really is no difference. Immersive media, synthetic. Immersive yeah, media, whatever, going. right? I mean, for us, I mean, for people <laughs> on the development side, yeah. you, you have a VR project, I'll pick up a phone and hire three guys. If you have an AR project, oh, I have these two guys and grab this guy from there. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about Vancouver. It's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. And sure. those artificial um, delineations between the different hype words, AR, VR, mixed reality, honestly, there's no difference. I mean, we're waiting for the devices. Right. Right? And that's somebody else's problem, I think. <laughs> um, but, you know, we feel like we're pretty, I mean, from the content side, the software side, it feels like there's really no difference. And if you're going down the hierarchy, if you've convinced somebody to give you money, yeah. you should be able to convince somebody to go take that money from you. <laughs> that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> good. I, how are we for time? Five minutes. I haven't, um, I, I went through all my ridiculous well, things. Um, you want to open it up to the floor? Are there, um, can we talk a little bit about Canadian modesty, uh, ambition, why Vancouver's awesome? Question. Yes? Oh, you'll probably want the mic because then they're recording. Yeah. Um, 
I feel I listen to you, and uh, what triggered me is the emotional missing piece. And I think that's what I miss in Vancouver is uh, the space where art and technology meets, uh, the space where people try and fail, but create something exciting that, as an art, as an experience, something that would put that city on the map. It's um, like if, it's actually really interesting. I mean, if you actually go to the Bay Area, that um, that artistic vibe that used to be there is being pushed out by high rents and so on, right? If you look at Vancouver, I know maybe not so much in VR, but if you actually look at the digital media space, the, the film companies, the computer graphics companies, Sony Imageworks, there are original content being made here. Now, I don't know exactly what you mean by art. I consider all that stuff to be art, and I think we're doing pretty well here. Yeah, I would also suggest taking a look at Emily Carr and just yeah. kind of seeing what's going on over there, because they have a lot of immersive art projects going on. Yeah, Center for Digital um, Media it turns yeah. out a lot CDM's of interesting amazing. stuff, yeah. too. They, yeah. they do great stuff. That's well, one, one thing I would... Each other. Yeah. <laughs> you don't tell people about CDM. No, I know. <laughs> well, one thing I would like add, though, is, yeah, yeah. is I, I do think that Vancouver as a market is very siloed. Um, I'm always stunned when I come to an event like this because I find out how many other companies there are in the <laughs> space, how many people are doing stuff that's overlapping and complementary. Um, I think these events are fantastic. You know, thanks to, to, to Dan for, for yeah, putting it absolutely. together and bringing everybody here. And I think we just need to do this more. Um, you know, you, you, can't, you can't walk down, uh, you know, a street. And I lived in San Francisco for a little while. I can't walk down a street without seeing, you know, a bar full of... Um, people from the industry talking and and sharing and, and that sort of thing in Vancouver we just don't do a lot of that um, and you know but but these organizations are are, are hopefully starting to help um, dissolve those barriers because I do think that if there's one thing that Vancouver is not good at it's that we we you know I, I, again I'm always stunned to find out that there's ten other companies that are well that was are, his opening thesis right yeah. we're bad at talking about ourselves. yeah no I, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely case yeah. in point yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, how much do you see open frameworks like OpenXR being something that you can bring into your company and get a head start by using something like that? Or is it a disadvantage to use something like OpenXR as your platform? So I mean, I can speak for us personally. Like the, the way we, we treat Motive is that it's really a technology aggregator. We're just there to try to make all the different technologies easier to use. Um, so from our standpoint, if you want to use OpenXR, if you want to use you know uh, Wikitude, if you want to use Vuforia, um, we can integrate that and, and give you control through Motive. So um, I mean, there's always you know the the more the merrier. We need to make this stuff easier to to get your hands on, and um, you know, open frameworks are a great way to do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think standardization is really key. It helps people save time, money, and get to mar market faster. Um, from our perspective, we support basically everything. It's uh, a lot of our time and energy, which is kind of annoying, because we could spend more time building actual product as opposed to supporting a whole bunch of different stuff that yeah. does the same thing. Um, but um, yeah, I think standardization in general uh, allows everybody to be more efficient at what they're ultimately trying to do. I, mean, I don't know about these guys, but I certainly feel like a um if it was two years ago, I think we'd have to build the wheels, but I feel like um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel for every single component. There's a lot of stuff out there. We just have to assemble it in the, in the right way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm a giant fan of any time you can not have to make something, <laughs> for, unless it's absolutely required and specific for the problem you're trying to solve. Sure. Fine, buy it, get it, license it, bring it in. Yep. You know, just make sure it's got the right rights around it. You don't have to give all your <laughs> shit away, but yeah. other than that, you're good. Yep, good. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you, folks. Thank okay. you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Hi there, Bonnie. <laughs> okay. So um, I want to just shape this conversation by having a couple questions. Uh, so I'll lead the conversation. Uh, for the most part, I'm just going to open up to the both of you to just uh, uh, chime in uh, as you see fit. Uh, I, I love debates, so if you want to argue with one another, we would absolutely love that here to happen. Oh, that's even easier. <laughs> it's even easier when you just met the person. Uh, and then I'm going to open this up to the audience. So that's kind of how, how it's going to work. So uh, I know, Bonnie, you're here in Vancouver, and uh, Michael, you just arrived from LA, but I know you've been kind of uh, taking a tour of, of the neighborhood. So just taking cue from the founder um, conversation, I thought 
thought we'd first just talk a little bit about describing the AR VR startup ecosystem here in Vancouver compared to the rest of the world. So Michael, you just got a small taste of it. Bonnie, you're a little bit more integrated into it. Um, how would you describe it? What are the strengths? You know, what are the weaknesses? How does it compare and contrast in your opinion uh, uh, to let's say USA or to other areas you've been? Um, well, yeah, I've just, just got here yesterday, so I've had a <laughs> whirlwind and um, got to see a couple of really interesting uh, companies and, and structures. And I mean, I like what I'm seeing, but, but my, my sample size is pretty small. It does look like, I mean, obviously Vancouver has a tech background, tech slash entertainment background from being um, a, a film production hub. And, um, and that is a really good place to start. That is kind of in a way, that's Los Angeles's basis as well for you know, kind of bringing um, this this technology to the fore. Um, and I, you know, what I've seen is a lot of energy, and I think you know, and, and a lot of different companies. I keep hearing about more and more, and I, I enjoyed the first panel. And um, you know, I, it, to me, it looks pretty good. But but again, very small sample size. But but the energy here, I think, is is one of the most important things I'm seeing. Mm. And I just arrived to this space as well, actually, okay. like literally, um, in that uh, my investing activities, I'm an industry agnostic. Um, Peak Fund currently doesn't have any investments in this space, although we are looking at a, a, um, a venture in the VR education space right now. Um, but Vancouver certainly has a really strong base in terms of digital media, visual arts, um, the interactive arts program out of SFU, and the whole uh, digital media zone, uh, Great Northern Way, like I think actually forms a very strong base. Um, so I'm kind of curious what is coming out of this ecosystem. Okay. Yeah, I think also the, 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 the Cascadia concept is, is a good one. Uh, there is, it's not just Vancouver. Vancouver is part of a larger ecosystem and I think there's, there's a lot of cross-border collaboration which I think bodes really well for, for right. the growth of this, uh, this industry. Yeah, I think um, I think the last panel had that uh, point that Canadians are not so great at marketing, which I do agree. Uh, we need to be louder and a little bit more aggressive. Um, uh, but um, one of the things that I would add about a corridor, I have a pet peeve about that word, because the the great thing about a valley is that things pool and stay in a valley, but nothing stays in a corridor. It's corridor is something that you pass through. So I, I question our continued use as Canadians to create all these corridors when we are trying to retain talent in our country. That's just my personal pet peeve. Let's move on from that, Bonnie. That's not what we're here to talk about. Don't get me started on the word quarter, okay? Uh, so I know, Bonnie, you're kind of new to AR, VR. Um, Michael, obviously you've been well entrenched in um, uh, the company that shall not be named. Uh, we so, can say the name. Okay, we can say the name. Okay. Uh, uh, but, you know, I went through some of the areas of investment opportunities that we're looking at. Uh, just w w where where are your passions right now? Or where is the groundswell of activity that you've been seeing? Or um, as you're shaping your own thesis, Bonnie, on this space, like, uh, w w what are you eyeing uh, and what are you hoping to find? I mean, my, my impression is the AR, VR space is starting, um, you know, with entertainment and creative media, but I think that underestimates the potential of the technology and underestimates people, um, because I think of AR, VR as information. Um, one of the key things that I value and emphasize within um, my investment process is experiential due diligence, um, as well as capturing information from all sorts of sources. So analysis, emotion, um, there's nothing better, like there's no better information than experiencing something. Um, and in the space, in the investment space that I'm in, uh, I'm an impact investor, so we have an impact lens and uh, the topic of impact measurement is a really big deal, which um, love it or hate it. And again, like experiencing the impact of something is the most compelling. Like yes, we have words and narrative and numbers, uh, to communicate information, to tell stories, to uh, influence and inform decisions, but nothing better than experience, but experience is one of the most um, cost inefficient uh, forms of information at the moment. And I'm kind of curious what uh, AR and VR can do as a form of information, as uh, a medium for conveying information and informing decisions. I think there's a lot of potential there. Can you give, uh, maybe not in the AR VR space because you're just getting started, but when you mean um, experiential due diligence, can you give a little bit maybe of like a real life example mm -hmm. without sharing too much information perhaps? Yeah. 
So um, I'm an early stage investor. Peak Fund is an inclusive angel fund, so we're investing pretty early. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I remind investors and, and founders that the ventures we invest in rarely look the way they look when we first write that check, you know, a year or two down the line. Um, and so much of our due diligence, although we, we do gather as much information as we can about the market, the industry, the venture itself, uh, really comes down to meeting the founders and experiencing how they make decisions in the face of uncertainty. Um, and, and so our approach right now, although kind of looks inefficient on the outside, but is actually vital, we meet founders over time. So we meet, one of, my, one of my adages is, we meet people before we need to meet them. Um, and you know, I don't know if there's an application for VR <laughs> in that kind of context, but it's just uh, an example of how experience is very useful in terms of uh, gathering information and informing a decision. So it, is, it informs my investment decisions. Okay. Michael, on your side, what are you seeing in AR, VR? You're very close to that uh, technology stack. So. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because uh, being in Los Angeles, um, LA, like Vancouver, is a very entertainment-oriented um, city uh, and, and area. Um, so it's very, <coughs> it's very uh, content focused in Los Angeles, but as a city, we are trying desperately to transcend the content focus because as, as has already been said here, funding content is hard. And uh, especially in the, in the VC world, you want something that's scalable uh, content is tricky that way, and, and it is also an uncertain play when you don't know what your platform is going to be and you can't make any really good um, forecasts as to how many people are going to be able to watch what you're, what, what you're doing or experience what you're doing. So um, there's, LA is making a move towards more tech and uh, you know, the, the Snap IPO I think helped us a lot in, in, in the city, and, and so we kind of try to push in that area. To me, uh, I, I wind up seeing a bunch of content in my practice because that's where I am and it's part of my background. But I'm very interested in, in the tech side and in the kind of enabling technologies and, and enabling experiences. A lot of, I think, what you were talking about and in, in what you guys are looking for. Um, you know, if you, if you program for uh, the Vive and then it's a major pain in the ass to port that over to um, to the Rift or to the PSVR, then it's just harder for people to develop. Uh, programming, you know, so there are companies out there that are trying to get these, each of these technologies to talk to each other um, so that it becomes easier to do. There are things like that. There is a, you know, we, we talked about uh, user interface. Um, is it going to be gesture? Is it going to be voice? Is it going to be eye tracking? It, w what are the ways that this gets done? What are the technologies and, and who are the companies that are creating something that's going to make the entire experience more immersive easier to, to create. What's, what are the companies that are going to build the ecosystem so that everyone can do this? Because you know, at, at Magic Leap, we used to talk about this, and Magic Leap does create content as well as, as doing the, the tech side. But our attitude was always um, when two kids in a garage uh, with, a, with some Jolt Cola and a stack of pizzas can create the next really immersive experience, then everybody wins. And, and that's, to me, all of, the, all of the components that come together to build something that can easily be accessed, easily be created, easily be consumed, uh, and immersively consumed, um, you know, are, are really interesting to me. And that includes things like uh, you know, better spatialized sound, um, smell technologies, which you know, there are a number of companies doing work in that area. If we're talking about, I know you, you want to air quote the word immersive, but if you're talking about, if what we're trying to do here is create an experience that is truly immersive, you have to use all of your senses. We do in everyday life. So, you know, the, the more that we can do that and the more that there are companies out there that can contribute to that ecosystem and create the overall experience, um, the better it's going to be. That, that's really interesting to me. And, and, and I do see um, uh, uh, investors looking at those kinds of opportunities as something that they can, um, they can you know, put their money into. And Michael, I know that you're you are critical in the fundraising efforts for Magic Leap, uh, and so maybe between you and Bonnie, could you have any advice when it comes to raising money as a startup? It doesn't need to be an AR VR startup, because in, in this, but you you could specifically give some um, ecosystem advice. But uh, you know, what are some of the strategies that a startup founder should uh, really think about when they're raising money um, for their endeavors? 
me first? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just whacked the uh, microphone. All right, well, so uh, first of all, um, investors generally like to invest in, um, in people. Um, that's, you know, the team is, is critically important. And so y you need to have a vision, you need, to, um, you need to have an understanding of what it is you're trying to achieve, but you also need to be able to show the investor that, that your team is ready. That, you know, you know I, I've said this a number of times, the best pitch is the one that says, you know, hi, I'm the CEO, uh, uh, Bonnie is my uh, CFO, uh, Tom is my CTO. This is our fourth company. Um, our first three uh, have returned 10 to 30x for our, our investors in, uh, in tw 18 to 24 months. And uh, your, your investors will be there before they even know what the idea is. So um, it's really important to, to gather the right people. Um, and, and so that, you know, that's, that's a number one. Um, and another thing, especially if you're going for institutional investors, you want something that's scalable. You have to understand the market. You have to know um, that this is something that can grow rapidly and give big returns, because that is what the VCs are there for. We, we talk about you know, what are the best companies, what are the coolest companies doing the best things, but um, uh, investors have a fiduciary obligation to their, um, to their investors to uh, make sure that they have the best chance of obtaining a really high return. So they want to know if they're going to put the time and money into your company that there is a big exit that is possible. And, and I always encourage entrepreneurs to think like investors and better yet realize that you are investors. You're the first and biggest investor in your own venture. Um, and that speaks to Michael's point about repeat entrepreneurs by the time they're on their well, maybe their second, but like third or fourth venture, like they, they already can demonstrate that they understand that mindset, that they're thinking about the returns as, as well as the, the impact or the, the um, uh, creative process of building a business. Um, so that's quite key because it's very compelling for an investor to come along and be a co-investor with you as a founder rather than, you know, you've got hat in hand and, and um, begging someone to, to fund your risky idea. Um, the uh, second point is, um, uh, you know, under, I, I meet a lot of makers and marketers. There actually are a lot of marketers in Vancouver, I find. Maybe they're just not quite talking to the makers and the business builders. Um, but there's a big difference between making a thing and building a business. And so the entrepreneurs that we tend to like and fund, you know, either have a um, um, uh, kind of multiple set of skills, like they, they are creative, they can make, they can lead, they can lead teams, they can sell and, and market, and they can kind of stitch that all together and actually build a whole, a whole business, because um, that's what it involves. But when I encounter entrepreneurs who loathe or, or um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm trying to look for, like, um, they're, they're almost like trying to avoid the capital raising process, like they hate it with a passion. Like that kind of worries me. <laughs> um, because as a, as, a, as a CEO, you know, the leadership team, especially the CEO, uh, part of that job is to make sure that your business is properly capitalized, however which way. It doesn't necessarily mean raising money, but you need to make sure that your business is properly capitalized. And so you have to embrace that part of the business as well and not just avoid it for the rest of your life. But or the, ship it to somebody else, right. that's even scarier. Uh, one other thing, and this kind of, I think, dovetails with what uh, Bonnie is saying, is uh, passion. You, you, want your, you want the founder to really have a passion, and he needs to communicate that to the investors. Investors want to believe, they, they're going to invest in a company if, if they believe that you believe. If they're having trouble believing that, that you're excited about it, um, you know, why would they do that? So that really, that really matters. And, and, you know, I saw that firsthand at Magically because uh, uh, the founder has a tremendous passion and a tremendous vision, and it was very contagious. And uh, I think, like, uh, one of the things that you both mentioned is thinking like an investor. Um, and, but maybe you can help uh, the folks in the crowd think like an investor by giving some advice on what, what 
what typical metrics are expected at each, each stage? And I know it's going to be different for, you know, different categories and different types of startups, but, you know, like what are, what are series, uh, what are seed investors looking for in terms of metrics versus a series A, for example? Because I find like that information, it just does not seem to be disseminated uh, across the startup ecosystem. And, and um, even more importantly, the, the, the startup founders are not thinking about that when they're going into pitch um, or thinking about even, even earlier, like, as a pre-seed uh, company, you should already be thinking about the metrics that you would need for seed and series A and kind of working back from there. Uh, so any insight you can give between the two of you on that? I'd actually describe it a little bit differently. Like you're, we're, we're looking for certain results or, or mm -hmm. outcomes. The, the metrics obviously measure that. Starting off, it's, 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 it's challenging to put the number to just one metric. It depends on the venture. Um, but when you're first starting, um, the most important thing is to have customers. Like you need to be be able, to, you need to be able to have made a product that people want to use, um, but also that customers are willing to pay for, mm. right? So I think that's a that's a key number. Um, but it's not aiming for the the metric first. You're actually aiming for that uh, customer demand and and desire, and then the the metrics measure that. For for Series A, I like to. Um, uh, kind of refer to it as uh, the sage moment. So one of our ventures, totally different space, it's an accounting workflow automation company. Um, and they, they slogged at it, uh, it's led by Catherine Dahl, who's an amazing um, startup CEO. Um, they slogged at it for a couple of years and then one of the key milestones that they needed to reach was to secure a, a distribution deal with Sage, which is a huge international uh, accounting um, information systems provider. And so Beanworks is an exclusive plugin for Sage products. And it just, like, their, their distribution and their reach to potential customers just skyrockets when they have that kind of deal. Um, and so I call it the Sage moment. Um, any startup that I'm looking at, you know, if they're kind of under a million in revenue, they're probably pre-Sage moment. And, uh, you know, part of our role as investors is to help them find what that is. Mm -hmm. um, because being able to secure that deal, um, the revenues do start to have that hockey stick shape, right. um, and, and that's what it is attractive to Series A. Um, and Catherine successfully closed her Series A at the start of this year. Yeah, that's great. So um, I'll come at it from a slightly different angle, and, and as a lawyer, I've got that uh, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, so for me, one of the very first things, if you're talking about a, a startup, a true startup, um, you've got to get your corporate house in order. Um, you really have to, you have to form the entity. You have to know what kind of entity it is. Um, you have to get that, that documentation together. You've got to make sure that if you've invented something, that the company owns it, that you've got your intellectual property documents in place. The investors are going to look at that, and there's two reasons they're going to look at that. A, a million reasons they're going to look at it, but a couple of major ones. One, they want to make sure that you really have what you say you have and that you can execute the way that you say you can. Um, if, and the second reason is if you don't, you don't look like someone who knows what they're doing. And they need you, you know, this goes back to the, you know, they're looking at, at, at talent, they're looking at the management team. If, if you come to somebody and you've just got, I mean, Silicon Valley TV show aside, if you come to somebody and you've got just a half-baked idea, um, you're probably not going to get funded. You really need to come in with, with, with the plan. The, the, you know, this is, I formed this entity like this because here's my overall view. Uh, this is what's, you know, the, the, uh, the IP is in. We own what we're talking about, and we're moving forward with that. That's, that becomes critical. Just that kind of basic foundational stuff, because if you don't have that, you can't, you can't attract the right talent. You can't do any of that kind of stuff. So, so that's foundational to pretty much everything you do before you talk to an investor. Um, and, and, you know, talking about the, the, the talent some more and, and, and something that Bonnie was saying, um, one way that an early stage company can get interest you know, and show that it knows what it's doing is to go out for the right kind of advisors. You know, who do you know who is in the field that you are in? Um, who's an expert in something that you want to do? Is, is this a shopping app? You know, who, do you, who can you reach that's a major retail expert? Is it, you know, is it um, artificial intelligence? Um, a company, you know, who do you know there? If you can attract some people and put some names on your pitch deck, 
um, that are that have credibility, it kind of gives you some credibility and, and gives you a way to go. Um, and as for kind of going to the the Series A, I tend to think that it's the same it's the same metrics because. Um, a good seed investor, a savvy seed investor, is going to know that, um, that there's going to be a follow-on round, that there's going to be a Series A and maybe a Series B. And if you aren't showing them what the Series A investor is ultimately going to need to see, they're going to have a tough time investing in you as well. So you've kind of, you have to lay the groundwork at the very beginning for what you want the Series A investors. Now, if, you know, in this field, there's not usually, uh, you know, everybody's pre-revenue in the, in the seed. And once you get past that, yeah, you want to have, you know, you want to have revenue if you can. But even if you can't, you need to have, you've got to have a prototype, you've got to have something that will capture that's concrete that will capture the, uh, the attention of a, of a Series A investor. Yeah, I really like that. I think that's great advice. Uh, but I will say that on the Series A, uh, just for VR, AR companies, uh, I am noticing that uh, the, the fact that you're in VR, AR is no longer going to uh, help you with your Series A. If you're a SaaS company in VR, AR, you're going to be judged like a SaaS company. So that, that need to have like a million 1.5 ARR is, is what I'm hearing is like um, uh, is one of those measurement points. So I, I think keeping that in mind, but I love Michael's point about, you know, thinking early on already, you know, I'm going to do my seeds. What do I need for series A? I think you should always be planning one round more uh, and then work back from that. Yeah. Fun fundraising is, is, um, it's a long-term process, and you're telling a story. Right. Um, and the story starts with, you know, here we are at this ba this foundational point, and when we get to this point, we're gonna, you know, say we need this amount of money to get to this point, and then from when we get to this point, we're gonna have this, and we're gonna need this amount of money to get to that point. You know, you're you're probably gonna be wrong um, because everything changes all the time. But if you have if you've got that story and, and you've kind of you've got a plan, at least you know the, the investors will look at you and go, all right. Well, at least they're thinking ahead. You know whether whether they're going to be able to carry that off or not is another question. So the final question that I have to end the panel is uh, around diversity and impact. Uh, you know we are. Uh, investing or working and supporting startups that are creating the new wave of computing. Uh, so it's a critical time for us to be making wise decisions around inclusion and making sure that the right uh, users are being addressed and that the right voices are at the table. So as investors or, um, or even advice to startups, what thoughts do you guys have on diversity and inclusion and impact um, as it relates to this, uh, this new wave? Yeah, and this is a big problem, uh, it, it, especially in the in the tech world. Uh, it's it's so male dominated, and and it, it doesn't make any sense other than kind of historical. Um, and that still doesn't make sense, but you you can kind of explain it to some extent that way. But um, it's just we we do ourselves such a disservice when when the companies are all you know middle aged white guys. It just is not we. I mean, half the planet. Is in Asia the you know North American continent is uh, you know what under ten percent of the planet and yet we think we are are talking to the entire world when we are actually talking to ourselves. So I, this this is true in both uh, male female perspective. It is true in 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 ethnicities. Um, uh, companies are just going to be better. They're going to be able to understand the world better. They're going to be able to come up with with more creative ideas if there is a mix of backgrounds and a mix of viewpoints. Um, this industry struggles with this. And uh, I don't, I'm not really sure why, other than the kind of the traditional computer nerd uh, um, stereotype. But it is something that, um, that is at the fore right now. It's certainly, uh, you know, in, in the political sphere, we're seeing a lot of, of fallout. And, and it isn't just it isn't just in Washington or, or in Hollywood. It's also in Silicon Valley. The stuff has been going on for a little while. And there's a, you know, hopefully we are entering an era where um, where opportunity is going to be um, is going to be more broad and and respect is going to be uh, more broad. But uh, yeah, I, it, we really, you know, we really do ourselves a disservice to to the extent that we ignore that. And before we close, like I want to address the how, right? So again, I gave you the numbers on on peak fund, and and before the the fund's three years old, and and but has been in development for like four or five years or so, and 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 five years ago, you know, I was 
I still remember this conversation, uh, went to one of the um, angel groups and at, you know, just, I had attended the event and I think I was one of maybe three or five women, uh, went up to um, the host and asked him, you know, do women, do more women come to this event usually? And he said, um, yeah, we, you know, we try to invite them and we don't understand why they don't come. And, you know, why, why women don't show up is, is usually because it's not designed for them. It's not an inviting environment. Um, Peak Fund was, was, you know, I did, this, I did the same. Like a fund is, is like a startup. It just happens to have a business model of investing. And I, I did the, the groundwork to find product market fit. And in my case, my market is investors. Um, I wanted to reach a more diverse community of investors. And the, the product is the type of um, ventures and the investment strategy that we're investing with. And, and so it was designed um, with a more diverse community of investors in mind. So it's possible, um, but you need to be open to creating and designing a space that is more inviting and inclusive to different perspectives. Maybe that might seem a little bit scary at first, but you'll, you'll find that a diverse community is, is, you know, we don't bite. Yeah, and I think, um, I think you know, the, the panel before asked, like, how do we not be too Canadian? Being not too Canadian means you make your mark. And so I think if you want to make your mark, Vancouver as the mixed reality corridor, you are shaping this next wave of computing, then you make diversity and inclusion a success metric in what you're doing as you move things forward. That can be our differentiator here in Canada and it has been in a bit in a way. So I think by parlaying that into uh, what you do as a startup founder and how you see investments um, could be a very critical uh, method in, in really breaking that chain and, and moving forward in a positive direction. So I want to say thank you to Bonnie and Michael for being here. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Big round of applause. And I'm gonna hand this back to Anne-Marie. She's back. Um, so now we're on to the lightning pitch portion of the event. 10 companies, three winners, 90 seconds each, no AV, no slides, just pure passion and love for what they do. Um, so I'd like to call up our judges um, to come up. Um, so first we have Aaron from iExpo. Aaron. Should we, should we towards the audience? Or towards, towards the audience or the judges? Yes, towards the audience. Towards the audience. Okay, sure. Thank you. So my name is Aaron. I am the CTO of iExpo Technology. Uh, we are focusing on VR and panoramic stitching algorithm and also the VR content creation tool. Our goal is to make everyone as a VR creator. Uh, we want to make the panoramic and VR creation much easier and faster than before. Uh, so actually, in our company, we have totally two products. One is the mobile version, another is the web pro version for VR and panoramic stitching and cre uh, content creation. Uh, for the mobile version, people are very easily to use our apps to scan surrounding area and capture it. We're using our algorithm to stitch and create a 360 environment for them. People are allowed to use our application to create, edit, and share uh, panoramic VR content to their friends uh, to do any kind of ag editing they want by using our feature. And also, uh, we have, on the other hand, have our pro version for the VR panoramic stitching, and uh, that was our pro version. The pro version is more aimed to the commercial users and professional photographers uh, using their uh, f cameras, professional cameras, to capturing to capturing the surrounding area and then uh, combine with the 360 uh, environment uh, by using our edit. Oh. Is it end? <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. It's so fast. Alex is on it, man. All right. <laughs> I would have given him more time. But that's it. Judges, are you ready for the next one? No, Charlotte's not ready. Oh, you are, okay. <laughs> Lucas from BioInteractive Technologies. Here you go. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, okay. perfect. 
and go. Okay. <laughs> Luke is here, CEO of BIT. When I'm playing games in virtual reality, uh, my hands are occupied, holding controllers that limit my ability to interact with objects naturally or signal to other players. And that's a big problem because the ultimate goal of virtual reality is for the end user to be unable to distinguish between the real and virtual world. Our product is a wearable that tells us what your hand is doing in real time. That actually solves the problem of interaction because you can interact with objects naturally. Our competitors are handheld controllers that occupy the hand, camera-based systems that require you to place your hand in front of the camera at all times, or Mayo, a band that reads electrical signals from the forearm so its accuracy is limited and its location non-intuitive. So our solution is unique because it is accurate, hands-free, camera-free, and located at the wrist. And we've actually captured that with our IP, forcing others to work with us if they want to pursue similar solutions. And the TAM uh, for the controller market for VR, AR is uh, projected to be $1.6 billion with a growth rate of 45% year over year. And some of our traction recently has been NASA VR Lab has requested and received alpha prototypes this past summer. Facebook Oculus has placed a purchase order and meeting request. And most recently, the two major OS companies in the world have reached out to us. So this will be a great time to come talk to us if you want to be part of the new journey of expanding human-machine interactions. Thank you. You had three more seconds. Yeah. That was awesome <laughs> to sign you up. Well done. <laughs> All right. David. David. All right, next up is David from Inverse 3D. Oh, inverse, just Inverse. Inverse? It's in VR Stereo 3D. There you go. Thank you. Uh, my name is David. I'm the CEO of Inverse Cinematic Reality. Uh, we are a uh, content producer, a developer in, in new emerging content. And we're basically looking to merge the gap between uh, world building and a telepresence using uh, reality capture. Uh, and so through 8K, what we're using right now, 8K, <coughs> stereoscopic um, uh, 3D VR, 360 capture, uh, we've got a pipeline to produce content that we can deliver uh, to uh, you know, Gear VR or to Steam or to a number of other platforms uh, for content distribution. Uh, and we've been able to leverage some really amazing partnerships with um, uh, some music festivals, which is our, our, our target audience right now, is sort of millennials in that music uh, festival uh, market, um, uh, with uh, two amazing partners right now, with PK Sound, which is a, a speaker manufacturer out of Calgary, uh, and then Shambhala Music Festival, which is a sort of burning man of the north. Uh, and we've entered into long-term partnerships with them uh, in order to uh, reach our goal, which is this sort of five-year goal of just making 3D 360 video now, but making the holographic walk around reality captured experience in under five years. And it's aggressive, but it will allow us uh, to have a market with both VR people who are experiencing the festival outside of the festival and AR people who can maybe experience what is the wearables at the time uh, to interact with people who aren't there yet. And it's an ambitious goal, but it's, it's sort of what our partners have bought into. Uh, and we hope to address it through our distribution channel which Hands is up. Uh, broadcaster Verizon on all handsets in the US. Cool. Thank you, David. <laughs> Judges, are you ready? All right. So next up, we have ABCDE Inc. There you go. And Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, currently, there's only 360 degree videos for live action content for entertainment. Netflix, Google, Amazon, Apple, and Government of Canada are investing over $50 billion in the next five years to. <laughs> to transport content management in the digital space, and entertainment industry. My name is Hiroki, I'm a founder of ABCDE Inc. I'm a filmmaker and a... Uh... Good guy. <laughs> uh, my product is called Cubic Movie. Cubic Movie is a live action VR and AR with room scale technology. It's a full three-dimensional movie where you can walk around inside live action scenes. 
cubic will be converts VR, AR, and AI technologies that com uh, <laughs> it's hard. Sorry. That's okay. English is kind of hard. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is so, I don't even know how you guys get up here. I think it would be so hard to do that. <laughs> But you're very good at finger snapping, and we like to press. <laughs> <laughs> um, next up, we have Lee from Vertro. Here I am. Oh, are you loud? You're good? OK. Hi. We've said many times here tonight that games are driving the industry in VR and AR. In the same way that Farmville and Candy Crush drove the adoption in this, we're making the games with the hooks, the games that get people in and get them playing. What we're doing a little bit different is we're putting a systemization around it, the same as we did in the 90s with the website, and we successfully exited that business. Our first game, Run Dorothy Run, is being launched here tonight. I invite you to come and test it and see what good virtual reality gaming is all about. We are, and I've done the same. <laughs> right, I'm going to take up the challenge that the panel had here before and say an un-Canadian thing. If you're interested in investing in AR or, AR or VR, come and talk to us. We plan to be the next EA Games of virtual reality and augmented reality gaming. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. That was great. All right. Reese, you ready to go? Ready to go. All right. By 2020, the AR market is going to be worth 150 billion per annum. But you guys knew that already, though, right? I mean, it's written on the picnic page for this event. And I've been saying it myself now for years. So why does it seem to be taking so long? I mean, when you think about it, uh, the, all of the investment focus in AR has been in the enterprise so far. And that makes sense, because it's able to demonstrate profits. While you might have a friend that says, I wouldn't be caught dead in public wearing that HMD, at the same time, Someone might be fired from their job for refusing to wear it at work, for example, because it helps drive the bottom line. If you had to compare it to the early PC market, it's kind of like a mainframe, expensive to buy and difficult to work on, which is why it works in the enterprise. So if the predictions are that augmented reality is going to have the uh, same uptake eventually as the uh, internet in terms of adoption, what would you say the uh, WordPress or the Adobe Creative Cloud of uh, augmented reality is? Where are the platform agnostic uh, content creation tools? Where does a graphic designer, a marketing major, or an advertising professional go to build an augmented reality app or get that content out there? Well, this is where AR Builder comes into play. For digital professionals who need to win new business, AR Builder is a mobile app development platform that provides a new way to build augmented reality apps. Unlike competitors that require significant upfront investment in hardware, software, and skills training, AR Builder gets you noticed by tomorrow's customer uh, without blowing today's budget. Yep. Angela, Hi. do you need the mic? Or are you okay? I'll, I'll take a mic right. just in Thanks. case. Angela. I don't know how loud I'll be. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Angela Robert. I'm the CEO and co founder of, well, it's a new brand, Conquer Experience. And we've got a product called Periop Sim. And um, you guys probably have heard of when a surgeon is in the operating room and they're waiting for the right instrument, they need the nurse to pass that instrument right away. Sometimes they have a patient open up, they're doing some you know, very intense surgery, and many, many times the nurse that's working with them does not put the right instrument in their hand at the right time, and sometimes they'll hand a blade um, to the surgeon and cut their hand, which is a horrible thing to happen in surgery. Our product, Periop Sim, teaches operating room nurses what instrument to hand to the surgeon in surgery so they can practice safely and they're not learning on patients. Now, we built our VR version before we built um, our commercial version on the iPad, but we knew we had to wait for the hardware to the hardware to become available. So in that time, we've been spending time um, basically getting the market ready, testing the market, getting our traction and customers. We have over 26 hospitals. We have over 300 nurse subscriptions, 25 pieces of content. We've signed John Hopkins and several um, hospital networks. 
Um, what our goal is and what we're raising money for next year is we're doing a big launch in January at the Medical Simulation Conference that we won an award last year. And we're going to be launching our our VR beta with three strategic partners, two I can't talk about yet, and one is the Association for Operating Room Nurses. Come see me for a demo, I'm at the back. Thank you so much. <coughs> All right, Mythical City. Oh, right there. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. You're good? Woo! No. <laughs> um, so I've got notes, so I'll play one for you what I was saying. Uh, so my name is JJ, and I'm the founder of Mythical City Games. We are a VR development studio based locally here in Vancouver. And we focus on producing inter uh, very immersive, creative, and intuitive VR experiences. Uh, so today I'm not going to pitch a game concept, but instead a new way of uh, rapid prototyping and testing uh, VR game concepts. So in 2018, we plan to launch four um, early access VR games and work with our audience to focus on the ones that develop the most traction. Uh, we're an experienced team of VR developers and we've got three premium VR games under our belt and a total of seven games uh, launched since 2011. Uh, last year our first VR game, Snow Fortress, was featured by HTC at, uh, as their official demo at Microsoft and GameStop stores across North America. This year, we ported one of our existing games, Battlefleet 2 VR, and uh, ported Snow Fortress to PSVR, and launched a new game called Sky Tropolis, which is the world's first uh, VR city building game that's a full featured city builder. And um, we are asking for a 400,000 uh, US investment for publishing these four games in 2018, um, and to establish Mythical City Games as a leader in immersive, intuitive, and creative games. Thanks, JJ. All right, two more. Danny, Precision OS. Oh, you've got props. <laughs> Tell me when I'm ready. Good. So in 2009, Charles Captain Selby landed a plane on the Hudson River when both engines failed. No life was lost, and you may not know this, but he practiced that exact experience in a simulator. Um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and this is what we practice on, saw bones, okay? The other people we practice on, as you can take a guess on who that would be. Precision OS has created an absolutely, mostly immersive operating room theater right now that you can actually go in as a surgeon, practice your case on your patient's anatomy with complications and actually realize those complications without actually harming a patient. We've been together for eight months. We've been in, in front of every single orthopedic company in the world, major players. We've actually already signed a development deal with one of the biggest players. Two of the hospitals in Vancouver are gonna have our technology in 2018. And we're headed to Switzerland to meet with the biggest global educator of trauma next week. Um, the power of our technology is quite immersive. And all we're trying to do is empower our surgeons to practice with purpose and operate with precision. Come see us for a demo, thank you. Don't forget your link. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. All right, Jonathan. Yeah, I don't know Do if I want. I don't know if I want it. I'm kind of probably. Give a mic drop. Probably be pretty shaky, but okay. yeah, no. Um, <laughs> hi. Uh, so why does VR gaming kind of suck? Um, you look like a fool. Uh, it takes up so much room, and you get tired, sweaty, and you have to wait for the headset to dry off between rounds. Um, hi, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I'm lazy, particularly when gaming. Um, I've heard lots of people joke about, uh, let's get rid of the crouch button. We're done with it. Uh, no, um, just don't make me do squats. Please, I, I'm tired of it. Uh, I, I, <sighs> Crouch-based cover is fun and all, but I think it's great eh, for Call of Duty or not Call of Duty, Gears of War, right? Um, Physicality is great and it's, it's good to see in games, but sometimes it's not, not quite fun. And so that's what we do. Uh, we've taken a very critical, focused look at finding the fun in VR. Um, uh, and so the lessons we're learning about what works and what doesn't is guiding our design. Um, and so we have a standalone project that's a uh, standing seating experience, right? Targeting the widest possible audience and using what we, what we have found as, as guiding 
uh, principles. And um, whether you want to just collaborate and work together, or just talk to me about the lessons we've learned, because I just want to share, um, please do. I hope to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So while our judges deliberate, I feel like I'm hosting Miss Universe, um, just a few um, housekeeping notes. So as you know, the VRAR Association hosts events globally. And in January, we're going to be hosting um, the biggest online VRAR event in history. I don't know, I'm just making that up. I don't know. They told me to write that, so I'm writing it. Um, so there'll be over a thousand people attending online. If you're VRAR members, it's free to register. Um, so there'll be six symposiums in education, enterprise training, storytelling, retail, and AEC. Um, so if you're interested in sponsoring any of those, come and talk to me. Um, it's a great opportunity to get your name and your company in front of people globally. So it, it will be a great event. Um, uh, email me or come and talk to me after. I'm basically just filling time while they deliberate. So I'm just going to flip through some slides. Um, if you're not already a chapter member, come and talk to anybody that's on the board. Um, we are the fastest growing chapter overall. Um, no, we've grown um, significantly. There's 45 chapters around the world. So if you're not a member yet, you get great discounts at events. You get um, uh, the ability to be a member of some great committees um, and just represent well in VRAR. Um, some of the global members we have, you can see all the fancy logos there. Um, so Google, Samsung, it's a great way to network with lots of people that are um, in the space globally. And these are all of our Vancouver City um, chapter members. So if you don't see your logo up there, also come and talk to us because we'd love to have you on board as a member. You can also have individual memberships um, and startup memberships and we'd love to have you on board. Um, we're hoping to do many more events like this and we'd love your input in what you'd like to see in Vancouver of topics. So you can come for that. Do they look like they're ready? I'm just, all right. And here's our awesome VR Era Global Hub. So even if you're not a member, these are all the companies that we have um, gathered that are working in the VR AR space in Vancouver. If you are working in VR or AR and you're not in there, um, please, please come talk to us because we're using this globally to promote our city. We're using it with um, government agencies. So we'd love to have as many people involved as possible um, in this. I don't know how many more slides I have. Hey, that's a good looking team. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so these are our board members, and um, tonight we wanted to also welcome James and Sharla, who are our two newest board members as well. Woohoo! Yay! Yay, BCIT and Microsoft. And I'm gonna, I'm not gonna cry and congratulate them because I don't know. Um, so there's VR AR demos tonight by BCIT, Precision OS, uh, Motivio, Virtro, um, Conquer Mobile or Conquer Experience, um, and Bio Interactive. So please make sure you check them out. They're amazing, all of them. Um, we're just going to wait awkwardly for the winners to come. Um, the winners tonight get one-on-one -on -one consultation time with um, Launch Academy, someone like Tom, um, and other investors, as well as tickets to Traction Conference as well. So we'll just go over here. I'm not going to tell jokes. They told me I should, but I'm not going to. How are you guys doing? What's going on over here? Oh. Anybody else? Dan, do you want to say something? I don't know. I'm just pointing people out. It's anonymous. It's actually anonymous. OK. We need for a three? Do you, do, who would like to announce them? Because people are really tired of hearing me. Nancy. Come on in and ask. Come on up. Yeah, yeah. You should oh, ask. Everyone's yeah. tired of hearing me. Oh. Really. <laughs> Nancy from the VEC. So I'm, Yay. I'm seeing the top three, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh my right. God. Let's get a drum roll. Yeah. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. All right. Sorry, you guys. That was good. <laughs> we got. <laughs> we have Precision, Conquer, and Biointeractive. Congratulations. 
Do you guys want to come up? Come up? Yeah. We should take a picture here, right? Photo? Yeah, yeah photo, yeah. photo. Photo up. Yeah, photo up. up. All the winners, please come up. Hey, judges, do you guys want to come on up as well? Oh, photo oh, cool. up. Photo up, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> there can be no audit. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for all right, well, they're doing the photo op. You guys can go grab drinks and food and try all those kinds of demos and chat. And thank you very much.